Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. Yeah, Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 14, we'll go read several verses here, and uh, we'll go look at this account of the murder of John the Baptist, and I want to make some few comments. But anyhow, down verse 14, it says, And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry for his oath's sake, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and bought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. You know, in our two previous lessons, we've been looking here at Mark chapter 6. We looked at verses 7 through 13, and then verses 30 through 31. You recall where Jesus sent forth the 12 disciples. 
And we really spent a lot of time talking about how they went out and preached that men should repent. They cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Remember, we talked about the compassion that they uh, set forth as they did these things. And we learned from the example and the pattern given by the twelve that they were, remember, they were faithful messengers. They went out and preached the message in the power of Christ and the message that he had gave to them. It was his message. And then they were faithful in that they demonstrated compassion as they ministered using the gifts and the power that Jesus had given them. And then finally, they were faithful in that they were totally dependent upon God to supply all their needs. And all of these, I said, each both lessons, I stress to you that, that these are foundational truths that are, that are applied in the ministry to this day. These are the principles that were set forth for those who would go out and herald the gospel. The gospel came to you and I through this very pattern that our blessed Lord set forth when he sent these twelve out to go and to preach. But you know, I made a comment when we began looking at this text concerning the twelve that sandwiched here in the middle of it is this account of the murder of John the Baptist. You know, we uh, have before us the beginning of one ministry in the sending forth of the twelve, and then here we have the ending of another uh, wonderful ministry, historic, God used mightily, when John was married by Herod Antipas. And, and this is not the actual place and time of the event, but it's rather, it's an account of that event. And I think it's by God's design that it's placed right here from where he sent those disciples out. And in verse 30, they gathered themselves back to him and they reported, you know, what all had taken place. They told Jesus all that they had said and all that they had done. But this is the record of John the Baptist, his murder. The forerunner to the Messiah, recall that he was the cousin to our Lord he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He's the one of whom Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, and what a comment that our Lord could make of a man. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. You know, this passage we just read, I, I think sometimes, you know, we've been, we've heard this preached and taught since we were just little children, and I think sometimes the, the, just how graphic it is is kind of dull if you really meditate and think about what really took place, how barbaric, the debauchery that took place right there. Saddest, maybe one of the saddest stories in our Bible. You know, he was a special man. He was chosen for the special mission. He was the fulfillment of several Old Testament prophecies. And again, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He was the last martyr of the Old Testament period, and there he was the first martyr of the New Testament period. John was a powerful preacher. He was a fearless prophet. You think about the, the way he addressed the religious order of that day and how he confronted them in their face. <clears throat> he was fearless. He was a true man of God. And it's no wonder that Jesus said about him, among them that are born of women, women have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And now with all that being said, John the Baptist is not going to be the focus of this lesson this morning. <laughs> He's not. Uh, while this passage reveals the details of John's death, it also records the death of something else here. And it records the death of a man's conscience. Herod Antipas degrades the death of his conscience. Herod cut off the voice of God. I remember years ago, I taught some little Sunday school lesson to teenagers about him cutting off the voice of God. He literally cut it off in that he killed John the Baptist. He shut him up. And Luke chapter 23 records for us that you recall when Jesus, uh, uh, Pilate had heard, oh, he's from Galilee, so he sent him over to old Herod. Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time, and he sent him before Herod. And Herod was excited. He'd been wanting to meet him and to talk to him. He was wanting to see him perform some miracle. He cut off the voice of God. The text there in Luke chapter 23 verse 9 says, Then he questioned him with, with the, him, then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. He had cut off the voice of God. Don't cut off the voice of God. It's, it's some stuff here for us this morning. Some truth for the saint of God and for the unsaved both. Don't cut off the voice of God. Herod was a wicked man. 
He ruled over one-fourth of Palestine at the time. His father was Herod the Great, who was the king who was ruling when Jesus was born. You recall him? It was Herod the Great who had the order that all the infants there in Bethlehem, two years and younger, uh, be killed in an effort to destroy the Lord Jesus. And when Herod the Great died, the Roman emperor, he divided his kingdom into four parts. And one part was given to this man in our text, Herod Antipas. He really wasn't a king. He was actually what they call a tetrarch, which means the ruler of a fourth part. He was no king. He, he had no kingdom. He was just a puppet of Rome. And he did demand, however, that his subjects call him king. Now, Herod Antipas that we're looking at here, he ruled from 4 A.D. to 39 A.D., and he was banished to what is now France by the Roman emperor for demanding to be made a king. So they just removed him from that, banished him over to, uh, that's, I think in the scripture it's called Spain, or in history it's called Spain, but actually it's modern day France. Jesus summed up the character of Herod Antipas in Luke chapter 13, verse 31 and 32. It says, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And Jesus replied, and he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today, and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. He was not afraid of Herod, not, not one bit. And yet Herod had silence the voice of God. Our blessed Lord wouldn't even talk to him. Now what we see here in these verses is a picture of how a person can sin against their conscience to the point that they're capable of doing just about anything. And, and we saw that right here. You know, it's possible to ignore the warnings of our hearts, our soul, our mind until those warnings just simply cease to be heard. And it's possible to so deaden the conscience that it, it, it no longer stands as a barrier between the individual and any sin that they might want to choose to commit. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, the apostle Paul is speaking to this people, says, a speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Oh, what a state for a man to arrive at. And that's why some people can do the things that they do without remorse or without any guilt. They seared their conscience to the point where it no longer it don't feel anything. It no longer warns them about any evil. You know, I recall Brother Art and Pastor Art pe preaching to us. Uh, you know, people say, well, just let the conscience be your guide. And he used to say, you let the conscience be your guide, you'll wind up straight in hell. And uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. I, I know what people mean by that. And the conscience can guide us somewhere. But in the matters of the Lord and in salvation, uh-uh, no. His statement was based upon the fact that many people believe that the conscience was given to help us make decisions between right and wrong. And, and that ain't always so. That is a false assumption. <clears throat> the conscience will only resist any deviation from the truth or any right or wrong just simply based upon what it knows. You know, what's in here? What have you been taught? What have you been subjected to? That's what dictates your conscience. And, you know, given the tendency to, of uh, uh, corrupt and fallen nature of our flesh, the conscience is not always our best guide. No, it, it's not always the best way to go. You know, for one who's been raised uh, to believe that the Bible is absolute truth, the conscience will help you know the difference between what's right and wrong. And it's based on what you've learned as a child, based on the Bible. Your standard for truth. You may have not even been taught the Bible, but unknowingly been raised according to uh, the moral principles of the Scripture, which used to be synonymous with this nation. You know, just taught uh, right and wrong based on that. That was a, a type of a guide for our conscience. You know, if you start to do something that the Bible says is a sin, your conscience, it'll, it'll rise up and tell you to stop. But if you resist that long enough, it'll finally, it won't mean anything to you. You know, that conscience will begin to get dull. It'll get seared. On the other hand, if you've been raised to believe that there are no limits in life and that you can do as you're pleased, you know, you, your conscience is not going to give you any problems. And that's certainly where our society's at today. You know, it, it certainly is. That's why so many people today are in such trouble. You know, they've adopted a philosophy that says 
uh, if it feels good, if it feels good, go do it. And as a result, they don't live by the truth of the word of God or the moral principles that sets forth in this book right here. But that rather they live by the feelings of their flesh. And they do as they please and their conscience never bothers them. You know, the most dangerous thing any person can do is sin against the truth. It is, especially the truth of this book. And this is the ultimate truth, but to sin against the truth. Paul speaks of a good conscience in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. He says, holding faith in a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. You know, a good conscience is one that knows the truth and it desires to be obedient to it. And when people know the truth and reject it in favor of their own standard of right and wrong, they sin against a good conscience. That's what's happening. Uh, that is what we see in our, in our text today right here in Herod's life. You know, this passage records the death of a conscience. And I'm going to get to Herod right now, here now. But, you know, as we move through this text, you know, we need to uh, allow God to speak to our hearts. You know, he might teach us something right here about ourselves. It's, it's some stuff here for the saint of God and for the, for the unsaved. Obey his word if he speaks to you today and, and don't sin against your own conscience. You know, I had to ask the Lord to show me, guide me in these things. And it's three things we want to look at this morning. And I'm not going to get but about halfway through this. I'm going to warn you right now. So we'll pick it up next week. But first of all, we want to see Herod's confusion. He was one confused being. He was messed up. Then we're going to look at his crime, and then we'll look at his conscience. You know, they're beginning out in verses 17 to 20. We'll get back to 14 through 16 in a little bit. You know, when Herod heard about the ministry of Jesus and about all the miracles he performed, Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist that had been raised from the dead. Now, we're talking about his confusion here. <clears throat> I want to consider the background for Herod's belief that John had somehow come back from the dead. <clears throat> Verses 17 to 29 form a parenthetical passage. You know, we're transported back in time to the events surrounding the death of John the Baptist. This is not the actually time or the place in time here that it actually occurred. So Mark allows us to see Herod's flashback regarding the death of John. Now, <clears throat> these verses reveal a soul in conflict. You know, Herod's fighting a battle between the flesh and his conscience, or maybe even his spirit, and he's confused and conflicted, and that is clearly revealed to us right here in this text. Verses 17 to 18, we're told that Herod held John. He had him in jail. We're told that Herod arrested John for preaching against Herod's sin. And if things haven't been confusing enough already, we're going to take a moment here and kind of look at Herod's background, his family tree. Now, we kind of joke about certain things in this day and age about the family tree not having a lot of forks in it. And uh, he, he is dead. It was grounded in sin and, and all kind of just debauchery and incestuous relationships. As I said, Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great. And among his half-brothers are Aristobulus, who was killed by his own father. And then there's Herod Philip. And Herod the Great had at least five wives, and he had sons and daughters by all, all of them. But Herod Antipas, the man in our text, he married the daughter of Aretas I, who was an Arabian king. <clears throat> you know, this is all in antiquity. Josephus, uh, a lot of this comes from the ancient history. It don't come from the scripture, so I, I qualify that with telling you this. But, but Herod Philip married Herodias, the woman in our text, who was the daughter of his half-brother, Aristobulus, and she was his half-niece. They had a daughter named Salome. We know who she is. And the girl had danced, uh, the girl who danced for Herod Antipas, her double half uncle and stepfather. So you can see how messed up that this outfit was. Uh, no wonder his conscience was, uh, it wasn't based on much. But Herod Philip was disinherited by his father, Herod the Great. And he and Herodias, they moved to Rome, and uh, Herod Antipas and his wife, they visited his brother in Rome, and Herod Antipas fell in love with his half-niece and sister-in-law, Herodias. They had an affair, and both of them, they left their spouses. 
and married one another. I said all that to get to this point right here. It was this arrangement that John repeatedly condemned. <clears throat> that phrase there, <clears throat> well, I just lost it. Yeah, there you go. Brother Ralph knows where I'm going. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there you go. But that phrase had said, that suggested a repeated action. He didn't say it just one time. For John had said unto Herod. So uh, every time Herod was around, John preached against this, uh, against incest and adultery from the law of God. He didn't back off of it. So every time he was around him, again and again and again. And, and John was most likely preaching a, 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 a thus saith the Lord message from Leviticus chapter 18. You might recall from that, I'll remind you, it starts out in the first three verses. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, ye shall not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Now Leviticus chapter 18 deals with all sorts of sexual immorality. It deals with adultery, incest, homosexuality, and in particular to this case here in verse 16 of Leviticus chapter 18, it says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. You know, the Lord was saying to his people there in Leviticus, he was saying to Israel, I, I don't want you living like the Egyptians from whom I bought you out of, and I don't want you living like the Canaanites in the land of where I'm going to be taking you. Now, that's God's standard. And that's what that John the Baptist was preaching to these people. Now, Herod, he was upset by the preaching. It seems that Herodias, his wife, uh, she was really upset by it there in verse 17. And so Herod had thrown John into prison. So there we see he held him. He had him under arrest. And he'd probably been there for, I think, um, around a year. I've, I've read that he'd been around around a year. Now, that's certainly, that's not the proper response to biblical preaching. But sadly, that's the way it is a lot of days, uh, a lot of times when, when the truth of the Word of God's preached. It's just rejected. And when a preacher takes the Bible and he preaches the truth from it, there's going to be times when he'll get, you know, a little bit close to where we are, you know, a little bit close to where we're living. Maybe it'll kind of like when that dentist, you go to, you got a toothache and really don't know which one it is, and he gets to pecking around in there. When he hits the right one, you know which one it is. And, uh, you know, when the preacher can be preaching the word of God, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost and pricked your heart, well, he's just a messenger. And, and, you know, he don't even know. I mean, he may know, but... God knows, I've heard many pastors, many preachers say that they might have somebody on, somebody on their mind as they're preaching and God will be dealing with somebody completely different. You know, the Holy Ghost will be using it in a different way. But you know, when that happens, we have several choices. You know, simply we can't ignore the message. Now, it's dangerous to do because it can lead to a dead conscience. Uh, we can attack the preacher. That's also dangerous because God will judge you for that response. Besides that, if the preaching is preach, if the preaching is preaching the truth, he is again. He's just really he's just delivering the mail, and that's what John was doing, and he was pretty bold in his delivery. So if we have an issue, you know, we need to take it up with the Lord. You can bring the need to the Lord. You can let Him work in your life. That's the third option that we have. You know, if God pricks our hearts about something that's coming from the Word of God as a man's preaching to us, as a saint of God, we need to bring it before Him. Get the matter cleared up. You can let Him work in your life to bring you to a place of repentance and blessing. Thank God for First John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, and if we say we have no sin, then we, we're lied. You know, the truth's not in us. You know, we're quickly approaching an hour, an hour when uh, preachers in this country, well, it's already here, but they're going to be persecuted for the message that they preached. You know, if a, if a, a liberal government and a liberal court system has its way, 
uh, preachers will be imprisoned if they preach against a homosexuality, and that, that's going to be only the start. You know, uh, even the gospel itself is being called hate speech by those who reject the Lord Jesus. It's a, they look at it as a hate speech. So uh, the days of Herod are not that different from the days right now. You know, the days are coming when those who dare stand for the truth are going to face hardship and persecution. You know, you can look around at, uh, you walk into any of these plants around here, and there's, um, Janice might be able to answer this. I don't know if it comes under the U.S. Department of Labor, but there's a thing up there about you, you got to protect it from being a hostile work environment. Am I correct? Well, all of a sudden now, if you're trying to witness to somebody and tell them that they're a sinner on their way to hell and they need a savior, that's a hostile work environment. So that's, this is where we're at. So we're not that far removed from the days of Herod. Matter of fact, we might be down the other side even lower than what they were back then. But anyway, back to Herod. You know, he held John. Then we saw that even though he held him, but he was also, he helped John. You know, while Herod disliked the message that John preached, um, Herod protected John from the those murderous ambitions of Herodias. You know, she wanted to do away with him. She wanted to just shut him up. You know, she refused to forgive John for what he preached, and and she uh, held hatred in her heart for the man of God. And I, you know, we've probably all seen examples of this in our lives. That you know, there'd be just such a hatred there for the place of God, the house of God, the man of God. No, oh, it's a it is a terrible state for a person to get in. But Herod's confusion, it's clear to see. You know, he hated the fact that John was telling him the truth about his sins, but he still wanted to keep him around. That's kind of kind of strange. You know, it even says in verse 20 that he heard him. It said Herod heard John. That's the most amazing verse in this section that Herod did not like the fact that John exposed his sin. He still wanted him around. Herod had a, he had a reverential fear of John the Baptist because he knew that John was a genuine man of God. He knew that he was a holy man and he knew that he was righteous man. So he kind of wanted to, you know, stay up a little bit close to him. And we even see in verse 20 that he observed John. And that is that he, he kept John the Baptist safe and he kept him under a constant guard. He didn't want to, John to expose his sins, but he really didn't want anything bad to happen to him either. You know, he had enough respect and rever uh, reverential fear for him. He wanted to stay up a little bit close to him. When Herod preached, when, he, when uh, Herod heard John preach, we're told that he did many things. Now, that can be interpreted in, in, in two ways here. First of all, uh, when Herod heard John, he was perplexed. That is, uh, when he heard him, or, or what he heard caused him great conflict of his soul. And he heard the truth, and he recognized it as truth. And then secondly, Herod did some of the things that John had told him to do. He said, well, I'll give in a little bit, try to straighten up a little bit, you know. He might have reformed his life to a certain point, but not to the point of giving up Herodias. The truth touched Herod's heart, and he tried to dull, the pain of, uh, dull that pain of conviction by doing some good things. <clears throat> Don't we see that happen nowadays? Yeah, well, yeah, maybe I'll you know, quit beating my wife or I'll quit you know, doing this or, or whatever, but they still don't get right with the Lord concerning their soul. You know, the most amazing part of this verse tells us that Herod heard him gladly. You know, the idea is that Herod enjoyed hearing John preach the word of God. Uh, he didn't intend to change his whole life and surrender all to the Lord but he liked this preacher, and he loved to hear him preach. And uh, it kind of reminds me of Pastor Art. You know, he was like Brother Ralph. He was well known in the community, and people saw him as just a man of the earth. And and uh, and he had some right seedy characters that liked him. <laughs> you know, they had no intention of getting right with the Lord, but they liked him. You know, Art passed somebody a food line or something, give them twenty dollars. You know, if they need, that's just the way he was. And I kind of see what, what is set forth before us right here in the scriptures. So Herod was one confused man. And you know, there are, there are many people just like Herod in our world today. Uh, they get caught up in the preaching or the personality of a man and they miss the point of his message. 
Uh, they like to hear their favorite preacher preach, but they have no intentions of doing everything the Bible is telling them to do. That's a dangerous way to live a life. That's a dangerous way to receive the word of God. Now, I love having a pastor that I, that I like, you know, but it ain't all about that. And Brother Ralph knows that, and we should all respect that. Truth is what he is and where God has placed him. But, you know, it's good to have that relationship. But, you know, to live like Herod was living, that's a dangerous way to live a life. You know, when God speaks to our hearts, he's extending grace to us. And grace does mean that we don't deserve it. You know, he's showing you that, that he cares about you, that he loves you, that he has a better plan for your life. And when he points out your errors in the word of God, he does so because he loves us and he wants to change us. He wants to work in our hearts. It's, it's grace every time we hear the word of God preached, every time the message goes forth to a lost and dying world. That's the grace of God upon this, upon this earth. Now, don't be like Herod. You know, don't play around with the things of God. Herod kept John and he treated him like he was a pet. Uh, he treated the word of God like uh, he could do as he pleased with it. And, and nothing sears the conscience any quicker than saying no to the word of God. You know, if the Lord's been speaking to you about any area of your life, and I don't mean to, well, it, it sounds really preachy, and I'm not the preacher, brother. I don't want to tread on your territory, but... Uh, but if God speaks to us, any of us, of any area of our life, you know, we need to heed his voice and obey his word without delay. Uh, you know, to do otherwise, is it's deadly. So I still got a, two more points, Herod's crime and Herod's conscience. We'll talk about that next week. But I think it's been laying some pretty good groundwork right here, just what we've looked at so far. So I'm going to stop, and uh, we'll pick this up next week. And Y'all pray for me that, you know, I'm sure that the Lord will uh, add some stuff to it and I'll be going back and changing some things. But uh, it just amazes me. You know, I'll look at a text and I think, well, I really can't, excuse me, I can't get much out of that. Man, you start digging around in there and then start reading some of these old men of God and, and God starts showing you stuff and walk away from it for a day or two and you get to thinking about some more stuff and going back and, oh, that's when it, you know, God just keeps uh, uh, helping you and, and building, and that's that's when it's real. That's when he's. That's when I feel like He's giving me something that's gonna help you. Something that's gonna help me. Amen. Right. Brother Mike, would you close for us? Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family. And I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm.